Okay, welcome everybody. I just finished my presentation a few minutes ago. And to be honest, it's not perfectly finished. <laughs> but anyway, I think it's good enough. I will share my screen. This talk is um, inspired by a question from Andre. He is curious how um, to deal with parents who are anxious. Uh, but in fact, I talked about this topic even before I met Andre at the UDEC AGM last December. And it also covered this issue of uh, parents who are anxious. That's our endeavor. Recently, I had another Zoom meeting and Andreas Hinz uh, has been there and I teased him a little bit and said, well, Andreas, you, are, uh, you remind me of some uh, comical figure and I meant this guy. I'm sorry about this, um, Andreas. I don't mean to, um, offend, uh, to, to, to be offensive. Now, um, later on, I re realized at least at this talk, uh, I'm this guy. <laughs> so you don't have to worry, Andreas, I'm this guy uh, in front, and it's funny because we are all going on an endeavor, and uh, the guy who's in front seems uh, not to feel very comfortable. <laughs> and what's also funny is that he has only one eye, so he can't see very good. All the others can see better than, than him, probably. So that's uh, a nice um, picture for our uh, meeting here because um, I probably see only with one eye and I'm, I'm really happy that you are here and uh, help me to see things. And it's also funny because, uh, in fact, uh, I, I wear glasses since I'm five years old, I think. And uh, in fact, I can't see very good on one eye. <laughs> I re realized that just uh, two, two, I think 10 minutes ago, I t 10 minutes ago, maybe 15 minutes ago, I put this picture in and I re realized all this. <laughs> That's crazy. Same, me too. <laughs> just one eye. <laughs> Aha, that's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> okay. But today it's me. I'm this guy. Uh, we are a group and we are talking about a theory and uh, to and theory um, often uh, you think of theory as something very um, precise and very uh, with definitions and with proofs and with st statistics maybe that will not be the case today but i think it uh, will somehow lead to a deeper understanding so we can build up a theory on it, okay? And um, I will work with images, maps, tools, and ideas, not, not me, but we. We are going on an endeavor and we have some, some tools with us. We, have, uh, we will work with images, maps, uh, tools, and ideas. And we use images to spark our curiosity maps to orient ourselves, tools to organize our thinking in order to get across some ideas. So it's mainly about ideas today. And so ideas are not, um, not always precise and uh, ideas can't be proven, I think ideas can't be proven. So it's just uh, today it's uh, mainly about ideas and uh, to get a deeper understanding what happens in democratic schools, in education in general, and in society in general. And what's interesting for me is that there are quite common problems we face in our democratic schools, which help us to get a deeper understanding of relationships between areas which seem to be quite far away. 
and I, I would like to, to get these ideas across. That's my talk about today. Maybe we even discover some truth, but it's uncertain. And it's, uh, it's anyway, it's difficult to know what truth is, I know. <laughs> but maybe we discover something which, uh, which we will say, wow, there's something about it. Maybe we can look there a little bit deeper. A few words concerning tools, maps, and ideas so that we don't get confused. Tools and maps cannot be judged to be true or false. Tools are just tools. They can only be judged to be more or less useful. Okay, We will see some tools and I will repeat it from time to time so that we don't get confused, I hope. <laughs> maps might also be judged by their accuracy. But a map which is very, very accurate does not necessarily need to be more useful. Everybody of us knows it. Sometimes a blurry map is sufficient and it's even better. And last remark uh, is ideas are free. They don't belong to anybody. Maybe we will come to this notion I just mentioned it here. Maybe I will refer to it later. I don't know yet. I already talked about the three requirements for a theory of democratic schools, which I find to be useful. This is not true. This is a tool. Okay. You can have other tools. Um, we can talk about maybe it's better to have uh, even more requirements for a theory of democratic schools or less requirements or something else as a requirement or no requirements at all. I don't state that this is true. I just recommend it to use it because it's useful. Okay. In my view, I think a theory of democratic schools should enable rational debate and help solve some problems. And I'm thinking mostly problems which we have inside our schools. And there are a lot of problems. Most people who have um, worked in a democratic school or, or have been parents at a democratic school, uh, they know that there are sometimes um, conflicts which go deep or even conflicts which don't go so deep, but we can't deal with them. And a theory should enable rational debate about those problems and help solve problems. That's, I think, a good requirement. The second requirement is I find it useful that a theory of democratic schools connects with neighboring academic fields. Uh, we talked about it sometimes, that we should have some connection to, for example, psychology, or for uh, connection to sociology, or anthropology. Uh, there are some uh, academic fields which are close to pedagogy, and therefore they are close to democratic schools. And I think it's obvious that a theory of democratic schools should connect with its neighboring academic fields. And the third requirement, I think, is a theory of democratic schools should not only connect with neighboring academic fields, but it should connect with related areas in the society. I call them related areas of social practice. There's a, there's a reason why I call them social practice, but it's not too important now. And I think it's vitally important to connect with related areas. For somebody like Andreas Hinz, it's probably uh, obvious because it's a daily business, I suppose, of somebody who is thinking about pedagogy. I 
presented another graphical representation. These are these images. I talked about images. We will use images. I will use a lot of images because it helps us to find our way. At that point now, it's better than to begin with definitions or with precise language. It's a blurry approach to what might become interesting for us. Again, this is a tool. I created this image so that we can have a look on it and see, well, it's quite obvious that a theory of democratic schools is somehow, somehow in the field of democratic education in general. Democratic education is broader than democratic schools. There are projects of democratic education which don't happen within schools. So um, there's a field of democratic education and a theory of democratic schools is somehow part of it. But in this image, you see not all of it is part of this field of democratic education. For example, if you have a school, you have an institution. And there might be theories of institutions. There probably are. <laughs> it's, I think it's sociology. And the theory of democratic schools, because it's about schools, because it's about institutions, it covers a little bit of this academic field like sociology, which not necessarily belongs to the field of democratic education. If we talk about sociology of institutions, it doesn't need to be in the field of democratic education. It's something else. I wanted to, to represent this with this image. And of course, there's theory of schools. A few months ago, maybe, maybe half a year ago, I just looked if there are any books and any professors, for example, who talk about theory of schools. I was curious. I thought probably there's something like theory of schools. Somebody had some decades ago, probably, the idea to talk about schools in a theoretical way. And yes, it's true. There are books about theory of schools. And I think it's very important for us to, to know them. Maybe not every single book, but we should have a broad impression of what's going on there. Maybe they have done our job already. <laughs> then we can stop. <laughs> I don't think so, but we should know. We should know what are they talking about if they are talking about theory of schools. And obviously, theory of democratic schools is part of the theory of schools field. The field of democratic education is itself part of the much broader field of general education. I think it's obvious too. We are not at the point that we only have democratic education and maybe, it, maybe it's not even a good idea to have only democratic education. There are so many fields of general education which we don't cover when we speak of ourselves as being part of the field of democratic education. There are many activities outside the field of democratic education. For example, just to mention one specific example, there are people who are very able to teach musical instruments. They are famous for being a very good teacher of the violin, for example. And of course, it has to do something with education. And it probably has not so much to do with democratic education, and it doesn't have to be. That's my opinion. And of course, there are theories of democracy. I have maybe two or three books, and I read a little bit of these. I, I am not very proficient, <laughs> but it would be nice if we have some ideas about what those guys are doing because it's democratic education and because we have democratic schools, democratic institutions, it's very important, I think, that we know some of the theories of democracy. But again, this is only a tool. It's not the truth, okay? Uh, it's a map, so we can get along a bit better and it's maybe not a precise map.
what's that? What, what do you think? What is that? This green point? <laughs> Maybe you don't remember. I go back a little bit. Enable rational debate and help solve problems. I think it's uh, more or less something which is within our community where it is the most important and the most valuable that we try to understand our conflicts and try to solve them. Of course, there are also conflicts between democratic schools and maybe the field of general education. There are also conflicts. And of course, there are probably many academically conflicts between a theory of democratic schools and the theory of schools. But I think it's a good idea to start to look at our own conflicts, what, what is happening in our schools, and try to solve them. And a theory can help us. That's why this green point is there. Okay? And again, it's just a map. It's not the truth. Now we zoom out a little bit. And we have something else. I don't know if you... <laughs> Remember, what was this color? Probably not. So we go back. It's connect with neighboring academic fields. It's quite obvious. I think this image shows it. I think there's not much to say. Of course, there are many other academic fields, academic subjects, for example, natural sciences, or for example, engineering. Uh, they are probably not too close to the field of general education and to the field of education. So they, are, they might not be within this um, magenta circle. This magenta circle is meant to be just those academic fields which are more or less close to democratic schools. Now there's the third. We go back, what's the third? Connect with related areas of social practice. So we zoom out. And we see there's nothing. <laughs> uh, so we have to zoom out a little bit more. And I like to look at this like if you are in space. Let's zoom in again. We are here in the middle, a theory of democratic schools. We are somewhere here. And in this green circle, there we have our own problems. And one of these problems is parents. Why are parents anxious? It's one of the problems in this green small circle. And I want to go on a, a journey with you on an endeavor. And we zoom out and we zoom out and we find that there's nothing. And we have to travel quite a far path. It's like if you're in space, this um, theory of democratic schools could be our home planet. So where we feel home there. Field of democratic education could be our home solar system. It's still our home, but it's quite a lot bigger. There are other planets in the solar system of field of democratic education. And we might know them very well. We might not know them too well, but this is our home solar system. We can think of the field of general education as our home galaxy. Our home solar system is within our home galaxy. Our home galaxy is a field of general education. In astronomy, people who study those kinds of things, they tell us that galaxies, they stick together. In space, you have lots of galaxies in one area, and then you have lots of space without any galaxies only some planets, uh, not planets, some stars maybe, some dust in the outer space, in the empty space. And you travel quite a lot to get to the next 
Galaxiehaufen, as a cluster of galaxies. You have to travel quite a lot to get to the next cluster of galaxies. That's the image, okay? We are uh, working with images. So we leave, and I promised you, <laughs> if we want to solve this problem with parents who are anxious, we have to leave our zone of comfort. And that's what we are doing right now. We know quite a lot about education. Most of us know quite a lot about education. Most of us know quite a lot about democratic schools. Most of us, if not all of us, are interested in the seer of democratic schools. That's our home planet. And we have to solve some problems on our home planet. And in order to solve those problems on our home planet, we have to leave not only our planet, we have to leave our home solar system, our home galaxy, and even our home cluster of galaxies. Uh, it's a bit pathetic, I know, <laughs> but I want to get the idea across. You know, in the beginning, I said I want to get some ideas across, and that's why I'm using those images. Now we have to travel, we have to travel. Nothing there, empty space. Suddenly, suddenly there are some other clusters of galaxies. I remember the, the image in the beginning with the Vikings. We are on our spaceship now. And we, we have to travel to those other galaxies, to the other clusters of galaxies, because we have some problems on our home planet. We want to solve them. We zoom in. And we see it's six with our own home cluster of galaxy. It's six, and uh, those six clusters of galaxies have names, art, politics, pedagogy, ethics, economy, and religion. Again, I will use this as a tool. At the moment, I won't claim that there's some truth in it. I think it's a very useful tool. And it's not my idea, this tool. If you will, I stole it <laughs> from somebody else. It's not so important who this guy is because ideas are free. They don't belong to anybody. But of course, if time comes, I will reveal who is it. Um, but at the moment, it's not important. Those clusters of galaxies, they have relations with each other. Religion has some relation with economy, politics has certainly some relation with pedagogy. Religion has some relation with politics, economy with pedagogy, and so on and so forth. We will try to explore today probably one, maybe two of these relations, the relation between pedagogy and economy foremost. Now, this looks like a bit as if this was static, but it's not static, it's dynamic. What I mean with dynamic is these realms sometimes are strong, Sometimes they are not so strong. There are times in history where some of these realms are dominant. Probably there hasn't been a time in history where these six realms were in a good balance. Maybe they have. Maybe, for example, when Peter Gray talks about Kanta and gatherers. Maybe uh, in their small communities, they had uh, this balance, but I don't know. 
But I think if we look at history, we will probably find that in almost every society, there are some imbalances. And sometimes only one, maybe sometimes two or three of these realms are dominating the others. And dominating the other realms means that they have influences into the other realms, which might be harmful. Those arrows might be not healthy relationships, but unhealthy relationships. I think we all can imagine some, some examples. I think it's a good idea to get a picture of those realms that they are dynamically interconnected, okay? Last time I did this workshop, I asked the participant what they think, which area does money belong to? And this is the result of the participants. Many thought money belongs to economy. That's our current mindset. And interestingly enough, there were quite a few who said money belongs to democracy. And also some said money belongs to ethics. Only two said it belongs to pedagogy. And four said it belongs to art. Three said it belongs to religion. Of course, it's not statistically accurate, but I think it reflects our overall mindset. If we think money, we think economy. And I would like now to question this. And to question this, we use another tool. There it is. Again, it's a tool. We can use these three words, which belong to the French Revolution, and take these three words and try to look onto the society and try to understand what happens in society and where some of these words like money belong to. There it is. It's just another document. I randomly filled in some words which came to my mind when I thought about society. If you think about society, you have all kinds of activities. You have politics, you have law, you have science, you have learning, you have literature, you have labor, work, uh, you have money, you have arts, creativity, religion, democracy, research, and whatnot. It's not comprehensive. It's just the words which came to my mind at the, at the moment. The idea of this tool, freedom, equality, and fraternalism, is to think about where do these activities belong to. Let's take economy. Many people, I guess, especially those who call themselves or who are called liberals or market liberals, they would say economy and freedom is important. It's important that those people who are starting a company, that they, they are free to do so, that they are not restricted so that they can act so that economy grows. It's one kind of thinking. It's by far not the only one of thinking in our society, but it's quite a common one. Uh, now you find myself in the position that on this endeavor, I'm also only one of you guys. <laughs> I'm also from the home planet theory of democratic schools, and I'm not quite confident with, with this tool. And why? Because we have left our planet and we try to understand something which is um, happening in other realms but we can look at it a bit and ask ourselves, for example, 
wouldn't it be better if economy belongs to fraternalism? Because it might be a good idea if we want to live in a good way, if we want that everybody has enough to live, that everybody has enough money, for example, or at least that everybody has enough food or shelter, maybe it's better to think of economy belonging to fraternalism and not to freedom. It can be very harmful if we are not looking at these relationships carefully. If we put economy into freedom, it has some consequences and we will have to live with them. So maybe it's a good idea to rethink the idea that economy belongs to freedom. Maybe it should belong to fraternalism. I take another example, creativity. Let's say creativity and arts. What do you think, where should they belong? Perhaps freedom? Yeah, I would suggest so. Creativity needs freedom. Arts needs freedom. Ideas need freedom. That's an interesting example because you probably remember that I, at several times in the last Zoom meetings, I said something like, I'm not so sure if we should try to develop a theory together as a group. Maybe it's too complicated. Maybe we won't arrive um, at any goal. But the real reason, I think, why it's um, questionable, it's not that we should not work together. That's not what I mean. What I fear a little bit is that we try to develop a theory of democratic schools, and then people don't agree on each other. And what are we doing when we don't agree? Maybe we want to publish a book. Somebody has written an article and somebody else has also written an article and third person has written an article and they want to combine it into a book and maybe they are not agreeing on each other. And then what they could try, they could try to um, find the common denominator. Let's vote. Let's, let's have a vote. There's a danger that because we think democracy is all and everything should be democratic, we begin to vote on ideas. We begin to vote on creativity. And I think we should avoid it. We should avoid to get votes on creative expression. And I think developing a theory is a creative act. I don't want us to vote on our creativity. There's nothing to vote on. Maybe if our creativity leads to some articles, we have to come to terms with each other. And at some point, it might be suitable to take a vote. For example, let's do two books because we can't go with one. Maybe there can be some votes not meant like a fundamentalistic idea that you never have to vote on any cooperative work, uh, but we should be careful. That's all I want to say. We should be careful not to vote on creativity. Where does voting belong? It doesn't seem to belong to freedom. Of course, each and every body of us is free to vote. That's not why, what I mean. That's not the freedom I mean. But if we are voting, why are we doing it? On something, like for example, in, in, a, in a school meeting, there's um, somebody wants 
to um, have the art room. Let's take the art room. And he wants to have one, one special room and he wants to have it um, to be an art room because he wants to do art. Now, other people don't want it because they want to have a band room in this room. Next people, they don't want a band room and they don't want an art room. They want, uh, want a sports room, for example. Now they have to come to terms. And usually what happens is that they vote. Why are they doing it? Why are they voting? Any idea? Oh, I can't read the chat. Please, if somebody um, writes something in the chat, help me out and uh, say it and uh, somebody else can read it. I, I can't read it. I just saw a pop-up uh, window here, but I can't read the chat right now. I'm sorry about that. You probably have written a lot of stuff in the chat and I didn't read it. Sorry, that was me. <laughs> My bandwidth is really low this morning. That's why my video is off too, and why I've been typing instead. Oh, okay. Have you uh, have you typed a lot in the chat? No, just a couple of times when you asked a question. Okay, okay. Uh, sorry that I didn't answer. I didn't see these uh, questions. It was fine. I just wanted to feel like I was participating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fraternalism, I think, is where we are. <laughs> Yes, if, uh, if, yeah. Um, has somebody something written about why are they voting? To decide something. Yeah, to decide something. Uh, they can do decision. You can take decisions in other ways. You can just say, I take the art room. Why are they voting? I think yes. it's. It's that balance between the needs of the individual and the needs of the larger community. Yeah. That's where it's both equality and fraternalism. Yeah. Good answer. Maybe, maybe it's the best answer. My answer would be another answer, but maybe yours is better. I don't know, because I'm only one-eyed here, like I said in the beginning. I don't know too much about it. But, but there are people who know more about it and we might want to talk with them. My answer would be voting belongs to equality because it's about rights. It's about equal rights. Everybody, uh, each and everybody has equal rights and to um, guarantee equal rights within de decisions you take, uh, you, you are voting. That's why I would have put voting into equality, but maybe your idea is even better. Those are uh, those um, um, terms don't necessarily belong only to one of these circles. Okay, it's not, again, it's not, um, it's not precise here. It's not a definition. It's not, um, it's not mathematics here. It's, um, it, it, it's a tool which uh, should be helpful. If it's not helpful, maybe we sh uh, should um, look for another tool, but I hope it's a bit helpful. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, wait a minute. Do I want to... Democracy. There's Democracy Britain. What would you think? What's it's interesting what you, you are saying, because I'm not sure too, but um, I have a preference. Somebody said something? Sorry, wh what is the question? Uh, the question is, where would you democracy, the term democracy, put? Wh what does it mean? Democracy? Yes. 
it's just uh, it's a word <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. But, and uh, yeah. we ask ourselves democracy has it something to do with freedom has it something to do with fraternalism has it something to to do with equality has it has it something to do with all of these equally or has it something to do with only one of these only two of these or maybe with all of these but not equally what would you think democracy it's our home business democracy i was going to say you're really challenging us at first i thought that was a funny question but now i'm this is this is what i wanted from this group is this of course you could put it easily into all three there's uh, there are good reasons to say democracy belongs to all of the three of them i will ask uh, somebody what he thinks about this question because i'm not sure either i have a preference for equality because um why it's a good question why um i think because it's again about equal rights I think democracy is not so much about freedom. Um, democracy, I think, is not so much uh, about freedom because democracy often infringes on your freedom. Often enough in your school, you, you are not allowed to do something because democracy hinders you because there are rules. You can't do anything. You are not free. You are not free in the sense of totally free, you are bound. Dem democracy bounds, uh, binds you. So maybe democracy uh, is a little bit more um, suited uh, in the realm of equality than in, in the realm of freedom. Freedom itself is a right. We all know it that uh, there are every man has freedom rights, declaration of human rights. Uh, there are many rights which are connected to freedom, Free, freedom to speech, freedom to have um, a gathering, freedom to protest, uh, freedom to, there are many, many freedoms. All of them are rights. So um, democracy, in my view, uh, belongs a little bit more to equality because it's about rights and freedom is one of these rights. Maybe not one, it's many. Freedom of speech is one, one, one right. Freedom of um, expression of your own opinion is one right. Freedom to have a school is one right. Uh, these are all rights. So uh, um, I, would, I would put uh, democracy more into the realm of equality and uh, maybe a little bit <laughs> into the realm of freedom. Fraternalism, um, fraternalism. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. No, we, 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 Anything? we, yeah. On the other hand, you could say uh, democracy is opening the door to freedom or, or no, the other way. Uh, you need freedom to, to, to be part of democracy, to have the right of participation and so on. So from, from my view, democracy is, is, has a lot of uh, connection to freedom. Yeah. And in, in many states, people are, are not free to, to participate in political Because they have no rights. So yeah. I, it, it would be my answer. Mm. would be my answer uh, they they have not the freedom because they have not the right to freedom would be my first take <laughs> but it's interesting make a really convincing argument because you first ask the question i think of democracy as all three things freedom equality and fraternalism but your argument is great because it it really addresses the individual rights the rights part of it, yeah, and that falls under equality. You you made a great argument. Yeah, I think uh, freedom. Uh, you you see this green word democracy, and uh, above it uh, some some words above it. There's uh, the blue rights. I think both of these belong to equality more than to the other two. 
Now, the most interesting question, where belongs, where belongs money? We are, we, are, uh, we are coming closer to your question, Andre. Hold on, <laughs> don't give up. We are coming closer. <laughs> <laughs> Where does money belong? What I said earlier in the chat heading that you may not have seen is when you were talking about economy as freedom, I was thinking of it more as equality because everything that's going on in the US now and around the world um, has a lot to do with with um, not just race, but also um, financial equity. You know, yeah. it, it's the poorer people also happen to be the people of color. So it's, it's, I have this tendency to think of it in terms of equality. But I, I struggle when, when you're defining economy, do you mean like personal economy or? You're, I think you're onto something. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what I'm on to. I just, it's like, mm, it's not, it doesn't fall under freedom or fraternalism or fraternalism. So I- What else is left? <laughs> yeah. I would, uh, I would agree. Money should belong to equality. It doesn't at the moment. Um, a few minutes ago, we were talking about democracy and rights. They belong to equality. Now, we are saying also money belongs to equality. It might be interesting to do some definitions of equality versus equity. Yes, but we are not here that yet, I think, uh, if, at least for this talk. Yeah, it was just something I was thinking about. Yeah. I don't want to go into def definitions in this talk. It won't, uh, it, it would confuse us, I think. Uh, later, we should do some definitions, but uh, not at the moment. Um, Any, yes? But, but my, my, you, you just raised another, questions in my, uh, another question in my mind. What do you mean by belonging? Uh, it should or it does, or both? Um, because of that question, it's very much depending uh, what, where, where I would locate some terms. Okay, um, maybe just um, tell us what you are thinking about. Yeah, if, if I look to reality of societies, money is belonging to freedom. And some yes. people have it and some others don't. And that, that is harmful. Yeah, yes, of course. That is harmful. Uh, so uh, a, a few slides ago, mm -hmm. we were uh, asking ourselves, where does money belong? And uh, we said uh, money belongs to economy. Mm -hmm. Now we, are, we have another tool. It's another tool. It doesn't really fit with the other tool. It's two different tools. And now we see, well, um, if we use this tool, freedom, equality, and fraternalism, uh, we would, uh, we would uh, wish that money would belong to equality. We see it does not at the moment in our society, and we see that's harmful. And uh, I would like to go back. Um, maybe I have to switch again the slides. I, I will try. Let me try. I'm not um, sure. Henning, excuse me one second, please. Yeah. I just wonder, because we have been now close to an hour, and I think the, the issue of today was the topic of today was um, parent fears. Yeah, and, <laughs> I'm sorry. I wonder, 
Yeah, because uh, it mainly remembers me to the workshop you gave in the last uh, AGM, and I wonder if we're still going to get to the parents uh, or, or not. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me, but just wonder. Um, I think we will. And uh, But uh, thank you for reminding me. Um, uh, I will have to um, be cautious about it that we uh, come to the parents. We are now, we are in some, some realms. We don't know, we don't know well. We are, like in the picture, we are in some other galaxy. We don't know exactly what's happening here. We try to understand it. Also me, I'm trying to understand it. And we will, go, we will fly back to our home base. And I will try to, um, to, to um, illustrate the re relationship between the fears of the parents and what we are talking about right now. Okay? We have been here a few slides ago, a few, maybe 20 minutes ago, and uh, we saw most of the people uh, said money belongs to economy. And uh, we used this other tool, and there we saw uh, maybe money belongs to equality, and it happens to be that not only money belongs to equality, but also democracy and, and rights. So my, uh, I argue that money, I will exaggerate, okay? It's not true what I, I'm saying now, I will exaggerate. Um, I, I make a case for, uh, for us to stop thinking that money has anything to do with economy. It's an exaggeration, but I want to put it that way so that maybe uh, there's a shift in our thinking. That's the point. I want that we feel that there's a shift in our thinking. I say it again, I make a case that money doesn't have, has to do anything with economy, doesn't belong there. And you probably feel uh, that's an, um, a bold statement <laughs> because we all think money belongs to economy. And if you are asked on the street, money, economy, economy, money. And I would uh, try to, um, I would try to make clear uh, that our thinking is influencing um, in which world we are living. If we continue to think that money belongs to economy, nothing will change. Parents will be anxious. And now to the, to the parents. Maybe I can, can come to a quick conclusion. Maybe, I'm not sure. I try. Um, uh, let's fly back to our home base, uh, which is uh, mm, democratic education, mm, democratic schools. Uh, we are in a democratic schools and we have some parents. Parents want their kids to be at a democratic schools because they think it's a good idea, because they love the idea that the rights of the children are protected in the democratic schools. They love their children. Still, they're anxious. Why? Why are they anxious? Uh, I, ca I can't read your chat. If somebody reads, it's okay. I write something, it's okay, but I can't read it. Somebody yeah. else um, yeah. may uh, read it for me. Yes, S uh, sorry, Annie. When you say um, why parents are anxious, yeah. it's all parents or only parents in democratic schools? Uh, I will um, restrict myself for the moment 
uh, 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 to parents in a democratic school, okay? Because parents, um, because democratic school is our home planet. Okay, okay. But it's also true for other parents in other schools. But we won't look there at the moment okay. because it confuses us. Let's look at um, the parents at the democratic schools. It's our home base, our home planet. We know it. Why are they anxious? Because they don't have say... enough money to pay for private school. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, let's say um, uh, democratic schools are free for everybody somehow. Doesn't matter how, they don't have to pay. Why are they still anxious? They're afraid uh, they don't learn enough in democratic uh, schools. I didn't understand you acoustically. Um, they don't think they uh, learn enough in democratic education. Yes, they think they don't learn enough in democratic school. Why is it a problem? Because of unreflected old concepts they don't really think consciously about. They don't question old concepts. Uh, what, what happens right now, I'm thankful that you say this, this uh, Gabriel, what's happening, that, that's what's happening within our democratic schools. We blame the parents. And I would like to make a case for the parents. They because have, fear, they have fear that the children don't get a good job in the future. Yes. Why are they anxious? They don't learn enough. Why is it a problem that they don't learn enough? Because they are anxious that they don't get an, a good job in the future. Why is it a problem not to get a good job in the future? They don't earn enough money. Yes. Why is it a problem not to have uh, enough money? No butter on the bread. Yes, no butter on the bread. Um, uh, and we could argue, finally, they, they, they are fearful that their children will die. That's the most um, horrific uh, scenario, uh, seeing their own children die because they, uh, they have nothing to eat. In some countries, it's a reality. Um, no, it's, it's not only a question of money. It's yeah. a question of domination. If you don't know something, you are over, you are on, under someone, something. It's, it's not only money, it's, it's also uh, no guarantee for the future. It's a fear, it's a fear, it's a no guarantee because the, the democratic school doesn't, don't exist for 50 or 100 years. It's just too, too small, too, no guarantee. That's a real reality in our uh, society that there is domination, no question about it. I would like to go uh, and look into another um, reason. Maybe. Let me, let me finish the sentence. I would like to look uh, for another reason because I would like to find something where we don't have to blame anybody, even not the evil guys who are dominating us. Ah, because it's uh, our own fault. Our not, own? Not, not to learn enough. No, no. It could be. Th then you are blaming yourself. Yes. I don't want anybody to blame anybody. I don't want uh, that um, people from um, staff members from democratic school blame parents because they are anxious. I don't want that you blame yourself because you don't learn enough. I don't want that uh, we blame anybody um, who's dominating us later on. It's blaming and I want to find a solution which um, does does not need to blame anybody. And there is one. Henning? Yes. I, I would say being anxious is a feeling. And yeah. uh, 
if if I would be a parent, I'm not. But if if I try to feel uh, or or if I see parents telling about being anxious, uh, their their thoughts are connected to the future of their children, and we yeah. never can be sure about the future of ourselves and yeah. of our children. Yeah. So they never can be sure that what the kids get in school is the appropriate or right thing for the for being having a good future that's true for every school yes yeah that's true for every school and especially if you are if you have chosen and and if you are if if, if a democratic school is your favorite form of school and it's 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 a little bit in the margins of society okay and the 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 unsecurity is even more is even bigger maybe yeah yeah that's true um that's true uh and uh, some parents uh, take the fear they are they are courageous some parents aren't as courageous and are more fearful and if they are more fearful they uh, tend to put pressure on the kids we know it it's not nothing new for you, for you, I think. Um, and if they if they put pressure on their kids, they infringe on their rights. So they uh, they are contradicting the very idea of democratic schools who want to protect the rights. So what we can do as um, members of democratic schools, we could blame the parents, but I don't want to blame them. I don't want to say to them be more courageous. You can't be more courageous than you are. It's useless. It's useless to say to somebody, be more courageous than you are. Don't be fearful. If you have fear, try not to be fearful. It's hard. Some people can do it, maybe. I'm, I don't know. But I know if I'm fearful, it's hard not to be fearful. I'm fearful. It, because it, fear, most of the fears, does don't exist. It's just we create our own fear with nothing, with zero. Yes. Uh, and how do we create it? By thinking. Yes, by, by, by thinking social what? Pressure. Social by thinking pressure. what? Anything. Hmm? Anything. Unreflected mm -hmm. concepts. Your, your thoughts mm -hmm. are uh, guiding you uh, everywhere. And uh, you, you, you have to start stopping thinking about uh, yeah things. yeah that's that's those guys um who who do meditation for example um they try to stop their thinking it's a good way to stop the fear um not everybody will uh, is willing to do meditation and um not everybody can some parents have to live their life maybe and um I, I have su I have a su suggestion. Um, do you want to hear it? I'm not sure. Maybe you want to talk. Yeah, for me, there are two principles. Um, uh, I think children always learn, not only in schools. So trust is one uh, main thing uh, I have. And the second thing is that my a child will learn anything every year, everywhere and every uh, every moment of the day. So I'm not not I have no fear in in democracy in a democratic uh, schools. Yes, uh, I believe you. You are one of the courageous parents. It's it's. Uh, I don't say it to flatter you. It's just um, there are some uh, parents who are courageous and some are not. And what are we doing with those parents who are not courageous? That's the question of this talk. Well, sometimes I found um, I'm the parent liaison for our school. And um, I have found that one of the things that helps is asking the parents when they first apply to, to come to our school is, you know, what do you want for your kids? Um, and nine times out of 10, 
they respond with, I want them to be happy. I want them to experience freedom. Yeah. I want them to, you know, all usually positive things. They very rarely do they say they're worried about them being academically advanced enough to get a good job in the future. They, they don't usually start out at that place. They want, they want happiness. They want rights for their kids. And so we remind them that throughout the process, you know, if we're having a conference or whatever, remind them what, what they wanted originally and talking about trusting in their children's ability because they don't come to wanting a democratic school unless they're already that courageous. So sometimes it's just reminding them that you had this courage when you enrolled your kid. Yep. Um, and, you know, you can continue to trust in that. And I, I think the other thing that, that parents struggle with is that, um, that idea of measurement. I mean, I don't know what it's like in Europe, but traditional schools, they get a report card every couple of months. So they know where their kids are in all the academic subjects and they don't get that with a lot of the democratic schools. Um, so it's figuring out ways of communicating and trusting. I I think you are right. I think that um, that's what we experience in our democratic schools, that uh, as parents sometimes have to be reminded of their own courage. And I think uh, you are right that parents who are sending uh, their children to a democratic school in the first place, most of them are courageous already. Maybe not all. Uh, maybe parents who are just uh, desperate to look for some place where their child can be without damaging uh, influences, they might not be as courageous. They, they just look for some place where their children can be, and they don't know too much about democratic schools. Um, that's my experience, at least. Um, I would like to come to a conclusion, I think, because uh, otherwise we get exhausted and we, we don't um, I don't get the point across. I want to get, get a, an idea across. Um, Hinen, yes, Hinen, uh, I, th I, th I think you 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 take the ch you took the challenge to another level. Exactly when you you said, uh, "What if the public school become a democratic school?" Uh, then you asked, uh, "What's uh, why uh, parents are anxious?" Then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think for you know, the societies are different from from one another. Yeah. But I think from my experience here in Morocco as a teacher, uh, here, uh, like, parents uh, care about uh, their their kids uh, uh, academically more than uh, living free or living happy. They want their children to study to get some higher degrees. They don't care if they are happy or not. They don't care if they are having a good time or having a bad time. All they care about, they should study because I, th I think my, uh, I think from my point of view, because uh, the societies are different from one another. In Morocco, you can say it's things a little bit harder in here, not so like uh, Europe or something. Yeah. So. This is my point of view. Yeah. I would like to express one idea. And I am not sure if it's helpful for you. Um, but I find it very interesting and I find it to be helpful for me. Um, Parents are fearful because they fear that their, their children won't have a good job. And if they won't have a good job, they won't have a good life and all this. And um, why, do, why do they need a good job? Because uh, only if you have a good job, you earn money. And I would like to 
question this thought because uh, it's a thought deeply rooted in our thinking that um, in order to get money, we have to work. And we have to rethink this notion. Um, maybe I can show you one more sl slide. Uh, I asked the people from the last workshop, what is the relationship between money and work? Uh, most of them uh, answered, you have to work to make money. Um, and the second most was income is a result of work. And I would uh, suggest that we turn it around. Um, in order to do my work, in order to do my work, I need money. It's not, it's not that I'm working to get money, so, uh, but it's in order to, to be able to do my work. I need money, it's clear. Why? Because uh, money buys me food and shelter. In that sense, money still has something got to do with economy in that sense. Um, but um, uh, I should have this money beforehand, not afterwards, not after I have done my work. And why? why? Um, uh, because we, we saw money belongs to equality, money belongs to um, uh, to equal rights. Why? Because uh, we are living, uh, as, as humanity, we are living on planet Earth, um, but let's look, uh, uh, because it's too complicated planet Earth, let's, let's look at a small society, maybe your own society. Um, and each society has some, um, some sort of wealth. And uh, the idea is to distribute the wealth, um, maybe not equally in the sense that everybody gets the same amount, that's not the idea, but to control the distribution of the wealth uh, democratically. We have to control the distribution of uh, our wealth democratically. Um, and how do we do it? Uh, we use money. Money is just a tool. Money belongs to equality, to the idea that everybody um, is, um, has the right to participate. Everybody has a right. There we have it, a right. Right belongs to equality. Everybody has a right to participate in a society. And in order to guarantee this right to participate in a society, the society has to provide um, the means. And the society provides the means by distributing money. And um, because money is not something which in the first hand belongs to economy. Money is a tool to uh, guarantee the right to participation. Money is a tool to guarantee the right to participation. It's nothing, it has nothing to do with economy. It's a bold statement and it's not true in its entirety, uh, but I say it anyway. Money has nothing to do with economy. Money is a tool to guarantee the right, the equal right to participation. If this is guaranteed by the society, parents won't have at least this one fear that they, their children won't learn enough and won't get a job. And if they won't get a job, they don't earn enough money and so they will be hungry and maybe they will even die. That's the fear of the parents and they are rightfully fearful because that's the reality of our, our society. The parents are rightfully fearful. It's a reality. Some parents are, are, um, are courageous enough that they know they, their children will make it anyway. And even they make it, even they get the tools in a democratic school 
to even survive in a society with, which, which is unjust. These are the courageous parents. But we have also, we, I think we should also think of the not so courageous parents. And, uh, and we have as a society, I think we have um, uh, the obligation to guarantee that each member of the society has an equal right to participate. And to, parti to participate, you need food, shelter, you need my um, um, uh, infrastructure, you, you, need, you need the possibility to go to cultural events. How do we organize it as a society to guarantee equal participation, if not by means of money? Why? Because money is the tool it's in order that people can participate. Money is a tool in order that people can participate. And if we don't do it with money, we will infringe on the freedom of the, uh, the members of society. For example, I think it's maybe the idea of so socialism. I am by far not an expert in socialism, but um, I think um, that's the idea of socialism. We have to guarantee the participation of each and everybody in society, and we will provide for it. Henning, may I interfere? Yeah. Because uh, th this is uh, described in the book of Kate Worthworth, uh, The Donut Economy. Uh, um, maybe you should uh, read this. This is uh, great stuff. We're, we're already changing uh, the economy from yeah. uh, linear to uh, donut economy. And this is what you describe is uh, exactly what yeah. it's fitting in. Yeah, I'm, and I'm, I'm not surprised that you, you say it, but because I think you are an entrepreneur. No, 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 no. Uh, I was uh, deep into uh, the circular economy uh, last yeah. uh, year. So, so yeah. you are one of the guys within our little community of, of theory developing of democratic schools. You are one of the guys who has a little bit experience in economy. It's no surprise that you find something in what I say, because you are a bit in this realm of, you are a bit in this galaxy of economy. Uh, so I, I suggest that we talk to people um, who know more, far more than I do, about what I've been telling you right now. Yeah. Uh, are you, uh, I, uh, from what I've heard, I think, uh, in order to make uh, democratic education a reality, a thing that's, that's work, um, we may we maybe must to uh, to to apply UBE uh, uh, you know universal basic income yes maybe it's if I'm hearing you right you think it's the solution for making uh, democratic uh, education more uh, uh, more not terrifying it's one cornerstone it's one yeah. cornerstone you have to be a bit careful you have to look exactly what people mean if they are talking about basic income. I'm not into this uh, scene. I don't know them too well, so I don't know what they are talking about. And I suggest that we uh, talk to them and with them in order to get to know them and let us explain what they think about basic income. I have the impression that some of these guys still think money is something which belongs to economy. I have the impression that some of these guys who are um, advocating for basic income, they think it's a gift from the state. The state gives everybody a gift. It's not a gift, it's a right. That's the difference. Money has something to do with rights, with equality. It doesn't belong in the field of e economy. And as long as we think that, we are recreating this world over and over again. And so if you want to know um, why are pa parents anxious? The answer is, there are many answers. You have told many answers and I think most of them are correct. But I, was, I would like to suggest one more answer which is not blaming 
anybody else besides of our own thinking. It's in our head. We are thinking in a certain way and recreating this world over and over again. And that's the reason why uh, changes are not happening so fast as we would like them to happen. It's in our head. Yep. Henning, I, I have a question or I have a problem. I understand your ideas, but I, uh, it's a very big job to change the distribution of money. And my question is, can we wait for the development of democratic education or democratic schools? Until this moment, we have all uh, over the world this basic income for all people without uh, yeah. working. Um, uh, I will I, I will stop sharing my screen. I think we don't need it anymore. Um, uh, uh, you are right. It's not a quick fix. I'm irritated by my second computer. And Henning, <laughs> sorry. Now, now you're blaming ourselves again, our thoughts. I first said, yeah, I yeah, first yeah. said, unperfected concepts, and you said, now you blame ourselves, our yeah. parents. So now you're blaming again our concepts in our head. Yeah, uh, you paid attention. I, I love it. <laughs> you find a weak, weak point. <laughs> you uh, dismantled my theory. <laughs> um, but I have, a, uh, but I have, but I have a, an answer for that. I'm irritated because this computer is making noises. Stop making noises. Um, uh, it shouldn't be blaming yourself. It shouldn't be blaming yourself. It should just be questioning your own thoughts. It's our thoughts. It's not the parents. It's not the anxious parents. They are not the problem. Anxious parents are as... Unschuldig auf Englisch. Innocent. Anxious pa parents are as uh, innocent as their children. They can't do anything about their fears. Mm. If you're fearful, you're fearful. And they are not powerful enough to change the world like with go into politics, go to demonstrations, build another democratic schools. Maybe they have a life to live and still are anxious. And I want to make a case that we don't blame them because they are not the problem. It's in our head. There's, there we have to solve it. And that it's a good um, message. Why is it a good message? Because we are immensely powerful to change our own thinking. Nothing can stop us. We are not powerless. If we blame other people, we make ourselves powerless. Who do you mean with we? If, uh, for example, so I'm a staff that member. belongs to everyone. Pardon? I think that belongs to everyone. Everyone can make makes mistakes and can change change something. Or who is we? Uh, we as um, humans. Okay, then I agree. <laughs> uh, may, may I sing, say some some sentence more? I think uh, it's it's important to to understand that there is a difference between judging and explaining. Yeah, of course. Uh, still, the quick fix. We have enough quick fixes. Uh, for example, what. 
Karen said. It's a one wonderful quick fix. Mm -hmm. If parents get anxious, just to remind them that one day um, in the past they weren't as anxious. It's 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 dealing with the situation we are in. We are dealing with a situation where pa parents are anxious, and we have to deal with this situation. And we can do it in lots of different ways. We can try to convince them. But I think we should be very cautious, not even not in our thinking, uh, to blame them. Um, not, not to blame them, but for example, in our school, our first pedagogical principle, is this right English? I'm not sure, is that education in first level or it's it's self-education auto education and that we ask the parents we invite them if they're interested to join our our project to invite them to keep a reflective um, um how you say posture uh, with the will to keep on learning and evolving so this is an invitation to them because this is the basic what we work about our self-education is the most important thing when we th talk about educating kids. So this yeah. is not blaming. Yeah. This is this is an invitation. Yeah. This is yeah. what we do here. Yeah. You're welcome. But this is our basic. This is our fundament. That's what we are doing right now. We are educating, trying to educate ourselves about certain things, certain relationships, which we don't know too much about. Yeah, learning is not terminal. Yeah. That's my answer. The talk was called, um, entitled, uh, Why are pa parents anxious? My answer would be, because we don't question our own thinking. That's why they are anxious. So we are the bad guys. And it's, I don't mean to blame us. I just want to, um, it's not, I don't mean it in a blaming way. But I, I mean it in, um, how, how do you call it in English? Uh, Aufklärerisch, Aufklärung. Enlightenment. Yeah, and enlightening. Like in the age of enlightenment. No. Illustration. Yeah. Consciousness, more, have more consciousness about our own thinking, where we are um, prisoners of our own thinking. And it's not a bad message because it's, as I said, we have the power to change it. Each, each and every body of us can only change his own thinking. It's maybe a bold statement, but I stick to it. <laughs> so, how can we move? Like, how can we push? Like, not push, but how can how, how can we lead parents to this uh, to, to to such a kind of a realization? Um, I would suggest not to educate them. I have problems with um, trying to educate others. I'm not... Yeah. But, but you can invite them to to discuss. And for me, this is like, I don't know if this is the right name in English, like Pla Plato's cave uh, image. You can know Plato's cave, I guess, many of you. This is this concept that we're, we're caught inside our, our own limits of thinking and that we go out of this cave. Yeah. This, is, this is this basic concept, isn't well, it? We can lead them out the cave. <laughs> And uh, I think it's not, it's not 
it, it's true what Meta said, uh, that it takes time to change a mindset. Not only it's take, it, it takes um, time to change your own mindset, but it takes even more time to change a mindset of a group of people or of a society of people. It takes time. Uh, nevertheless, I think there are so many people who are uh, thinking about basic income, so many initiatives. And we could connect with them and get in touch with them. And maybe it's interesting for us. Maybe we, they find our approach interesting. Um, I would like to... Yeah investigate this a little bit more. I think we're on a good uh, track already because we found each other. We are on this platform thinking about uh, democratic theory. Um, what we can do is um, trigger the curiosity of uh, people and um, challenge them with questions uh, and uh, let them think uh, themselves. Um, and I, I agree that it takes time, uh, but we should continue doing what we are doing. And uh, step by step, uh, we will uh, get there. Roma? Yes. Um, uh, do you think that without money, democratic schools, are possible and with money it's not possible it's not so simple it's no I think it's, it's not so simple with, yeah. with money with a, a concept of money it's possible with uh, income universal income or not you can you can have you can put uh, in the light the democratic school and the concept and the the benefits um no yes um, I'm not sure if I understood your question. I don't think that it's uh, quite as simple as to have some basic income and everything is all right. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I don't think it's as simple as that. No, 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 no. No, but just to to kill money, it's not the the first step for. Uh, broadcast uh, a democratic schools. I it's, didn't understand. Um, you don't need to uh, don't to erase money to no. to to no. put democratic schools just only for maybe the the only solution for education for learning. It's not necessary. You can you can have you can have democratic school with money. It's possible. I think it depends on the environment, Roma, because if you yeah. think about a community, for example, in Israel, in a kibbutz, and there's a community around working in an economic system which is self-sustaining, maybe they have a democratic school without uh, money because it's inside the community economy. And this could happen also in other models, economical, social economical models like um, the anarchist ideas, or I don't know the if you know that well, the anarchist ideas, because I know that in Germany, the anarchy is a very bad word used. But here in Spain, the anarchistic uh, tradition is like about self-organization um, and empowerment of the people. Uh, also, and we have Wiebke here, I think she's living in an eco-village, uh, like models, like eco-villages, which talk about self-organization on a local level. And this could lead you to an uh, economic environment where you don't necessarily talk about money. And this is also very important and interesting for the pedagogical environment of a school. Money is uh, a great tool. We shouldn't, um, uh, we shouldn't try to get rid of it. Mike? Henny, you didn't reply to Meta's remark about the discrepancies in time. I mean, your approach is pretty convincing and I like it. And as you know, but 
This will take at least 25 years <laughs> and the majority of all parents and children are closer to death than now and they won't engage in such an approach. So we have to have two things. We have this broader scope or the further outlying horizon and then we have to do something now. Yeah. And this is uh, not yet uh, answered by my talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's true. Um, in a way, uh, it's a shift in consciousness. It's maybe it's too pathetic. It's a shift in thinking, which is on one hand very easy, and on the other hand, it's it's terribly difficult um, because it changes our points of reference. Like, for example, when Galileo Galilei uh, said it's the Earth which circumvents the sun. Karen is nodding her head, so <laughs> it's understandable. <laughs> um, it was very difficult for the, uh, for the um, people to accept it because it changed the point of reference. They had, as, as a point of reference, they had the Earth. Earth was fixed. Sun was rotating. And uh, this shift is easy and difficult at, at the same time. Easy because uh, most children um, nowadays, if you uh, talk to them, they know the Earth is circumventing the sun, not the other way around. So it must be an easy thought. It's not something difficult. But to make this change, uh, it's terribly difficult because you lose your point of reference. Earth is no longer a point of reference. Sun is. And um, in our example, there will be some shifts. Money doesn't belong to economy, hey? <laughs> it's, a, it's a tool to guarantee the equal participation, the right to equal participation. It's a tool, it's a valuable tool to guarantee the right to equal participation of each and everybody in a society. That's what money about. We have to decide democratically about money. It's uh, something is shifting. The idea uh, itself is not very difficult, but we are not used to think in this way. But here again, there are some communities already which are working a different way with money yeah. and they're sharing in a different way. And maybe they have edu educational projects which work also like inside this community. So yes, money is a tool. It's like the blood inside the organism, but um, the, the organs or the different bodies can organize different. And for me, it's not just the economical um, dimension. I noticed that we, in our school, uh, we are like inside our school educational bubble and we notice that the kids, they don't want to leave the school after four o'clock and go home, everybody to her, their own little flat. They want to stay together. And for me, this is also the, the dimension where I see there's also a social and a pedagogical need for this community. And I think this is something, and if Stella says, or, or Mike says, this is about 25 years, this is maybe when we think globally, but if we think on our local responsibility and, and possibilities, for example, to go and found a community like an eco-village, we can change our, our very local reality 
And, and th I think this is important to do. And this is not just economically important, also pedagogically important, because what I see with our kids is that we teach them for a maybe better future where they can free their mind, but they don't have references in real life or very, very little. So they end up go going back into the same channels because they don't see, hey, here's another um, social economical uh, model I can follow. So this is very rare. And I think this is very, very important to go out of our education bubble and think more on the social bubble in this local possibilities which are a lot of effort and are very difficult but i'm i think this is very important and if we talk about talking about with people for example i don't i don't know if you know gen the global eco village network for example and i think this is a very important thing uh, we have to open our mind um, and go further than just our uh, educational bubble thank you I would like to come to an end. Um, we have talked about two hours and I'm a bit exhausted now. Um, I don't, uh, you, you see this, uh, this picture and I like this picture <laughs> because this guy who pretends to be the leader <laughs> doesn't know what to do next. Was machen wir jetzt? I don't know. <laughs> du holst endlich die Gitarre raus, die du <laughs> Das kommt vielleicht auch noch. Heute nicht mehr. Okay. I was just saying that he should pull out his guitar, what he didn't use last time. Thank you for listening and for discussing. Um, yeah. Thank you, Henning. Yeah. Was, uh, was Thank great. you, Ming. Yeah. A, a lot That's of thoughts. Some new ideas to think about. Yeah. Yep. A lot of thoughts with, with me as well. And was... I'm happy to hear some other talks, maybe from people. And so that I'm not always. Oh, today I was in this role of this guy. And, but I also like to listen to people who have to say something which I'm not familiar with. I have, I have, I have a, a joke from East Germany, from German Democratic Republic times, and that goes like this. Communism is a very good idea. It is pretty convincing. Only the first 200 years are bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So it's a kind of similarity in this. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there's a similar saying about democratic schools. <laughs> Great concept. Uh, if only the children weren't here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mike, I don't get it. The first 200 years are of not communism. Good, of the yeah, communism, yeah. communism is a very good idea. It will help everybody and it's a solution of everything. Only the first 200 years are pretty difficult to survive. Okay, so Thank we you. have uh, we have around 100 years uh, behind us already. So only about 96 years now. Mm -hmm. So the younger people may have a chance. Like Henning. Yeah, <laughs> like the, the shift in the worldview of the Galilean revolution. Is it the name for it? No, it's the sun revolution. Sun revolution. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it took the Catholic Church, I think, 500 years to accept it, to, uh, to reconcile Galileo, I think. <laughs> Henning, I just would like to say thank you for your inspiration and inspiration is something we all can do i think at, at the end we cannot educate someone we cannot lead someone somewhere yeah. but, we, but we can inspire people yeah and so, thank you <laughs> i'm quite sure that that i haven't educated you against your will because you showed up 
on your own. <laughs> Selbstgewähltes Elend. Self-chosen misery. <laughs> I, I just I, I, as I said at, at the last all group meeting, I, I wanted this because I want to be challenged. I want to think differently. I've been in it a long time and, and having new ideas and things to ponder is what I wanted from this group. So thank you. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I'm not so thankful, Henning, because he's talk talking about this for months now. Mm -hmm. all, always the same. Yes. <laughs> Until Mike also understands. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long time. <laughs> 200 years. <laughs> 200 years. <laughs> okay. Bye. See you. Okay, bye. 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 Thank bye. you. Bye. 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 bye.